Hi everyone, welcome back to Useful Genetics. This is Lecture 2M, where we're going to talk about the origins of genes. And most new genes begin as particular kind of mutations, as duplications that create copies of existing genes. This can be most commonly copies of genes that are already in the organism's genome, but new genes can also be inserted from DNA that's been brought in from another species. Recently, we've discovered that more often than we used to think, new genes can also arise from non-functional sequences. Now, you'll remember from Module 1 that we talked about the evolutionary continuity of DNA, how, like cells, every DNA strand originates by replication from existing DNA. So we can trace DNA's ancestry all the way back through the history of life. Well, for most genes, we can do the same thing, at least in principle. Most genes, it's clear, arise as copies of existing genes. And for some genes, they're so well conserved across the different groups that we can also trace their ancestry back almost all the way to the common ancestor of all living things. Most genes arise as duplications of an existing gene. Here's a simple example. This is just like the duplication scenario that we described um, a few lectures ago, where a segment of the genome has become duplicated, in this case forming a tandem duplication where the two copies are side by side. But the duplication could also create a second copy somewhere else in the genome. Now, what kinds of events can cause this? Well, Mistakes by DNA polymerase, um, especially if there are repeated sequences in the neighborhood, DNA polymerase can sort of lose track of where it was and start in a new place. And if the new place it starts at is behind where it already was, this can result in duplication of a segment. Viruses and um, genetic parasites such as mobile elements can also cause duplications when their insertion mechanisms that they use to insert into the genome go wrong. Many other chromosome errors can also cause duplications, um, as can whole chromosome duplications that arise through mistakes in cell division and whole genome duplications that arise in other kinds of cell division. Um, these chromosome errors we'll discuss in Module 10. Now, rarely, rather than duplicating an existing gene, an organism will acquire a new gene from the genome of another organism. Often this is a DNA fragment that's been brought into the cell, say, by a virus. And such DNA fragments are most commonly, they're degraded, but sometimes the cell's DNA repair machinery thinks they're just part of the chromosome that fell out, and that it will insert the DNA into the chromosome. So now these new sequences have become part of the genome of the organism. They're covalently part of the DNA. As far as DNA polymerase is concerned, they're just another string of A's and G's and C's and T's. Now, horizontal gene transfer, as I said, can be caused by infecting viruses because viruses all too often will, instead of packaging their own DNA or RNA, they'll package DNA or RNA from the genome of the cell they were just infecting. Um, the sequences could also come from the genomes of um, usually bacterial, commensal, or pathogenic cells that are living in or on the organism. Um, they can come directly, be brought in by mobile elements, um, pieces of genomic DNA can become part of mobile elements, then be inserted into new locations and new organisms. And many genes, many, many of the genes in our genome, have been transferred to our chromosomes from the chromosomes of the bacteria that gave rise to the organelles mitochondria and chloroplasts. And we'll talk more about this in Module 11. Now, not all genes arise as copies of existing genes. We're realizing more than we used to that genes can also arise from sequences that weren't genes at all. They can arise from the junk DNA in our genomes. And I indicated this here with little yellow stars just to indicate spontaneous new genes. Now, 
here's how this happens. Our, we know that random sequences can, just by chance, contain two kinds of things that are very important for the formation of new genes. They can contain signals, just by chance, they contain, com con contain combinations of bases, strings of bases, that function as signals that promote transcription. Many of these signals are actually very short sequences, so it's easy for components of these signals to arise easily by chance and be present at many places in a random sequence. Similarly, when we talked about open reading frames, you remember that open reading frames exist all through the genome, short reading frames, where there's a start codon and then just a little ways over there's a stop codon, are very, very common. They're normal in DNA sequences. And some, of, although most of these are quite short, just by chance, some of them will be fairly long, even though they're not in genes. They're in sequences that have been mutating randomly for millions of years and have no biological function. Now, if these two kinds of signals coincide so that there's a signal that promotes transcription that's just upstream of a by chance open reading frame, this creates segments of DNA that can be transcribed and translated and thus can function as new genes. Now, of course, these events are, very, are rare, but You'll remember from the diagram of the components of the human genome that almost all of our genome consists of sequences that don't have any coding function. And that means that we have almost 3 billion sequences in each of our two copies of our genome, 3 billion sequences where such events can occur. So it's almost inevitable that at some places in the genome, there will be sequences by chance, sequences that promote transcription, and longish open reading frames adjacent to them. If these new genes are beneficial, the protein that's produced actually helps the cell, then natural selection can step in and will select for additional genetic changes that make this new sequence more functional. So here's the question. Most likely, when such a new gene originates by chance, it's going to be pretty short. The protein it makes is not going to be long enough to fold up into a complex catalytical enzyme. It'll have to start out by doing something quite simple. But if that something is beneficial, then selection would favor mutations that increased the length of the gene in ways that made it more functional. So what kind of mutation could increase the length of a short new gene? And the answer is, answers are, mutations that change the stop codon of the gene to an amino acid codon are going to make the reading frame longer, because the reading frame is defined by the stop codon that ends it. Also, um, a deletion in front of the stop codon won't change the sequence of the codon itself, but it will stop it from functioning as a stop codon because it will now be in the wrong reading frame. So it won't be recognized as a stop codon anymore. It won't function as a stop codon transcribing this gene because it'll be out of frame from the start codon. So what we've done, we've considered how new genes usually arise from old genes, most commonly by duplication of DNA already in the cell, but occasionally by transfer of genes that had evolved in some other organism and whose DNA was brought into the cell. And we talked about how genes can also arise from random sequences if there's just by chance a signal for transcription and a reading frame that's long enough to generate a functional protein. Coming up next, we're going to think about the outcomes of these gene duplication events um, in the context of particularly gene families and of diverging gene functions. I hope to see you there.